welcome you uh, to this second lecture, which is part of the <coughs> annual series. Uh, this is part of the Burnside Buddhism Program's Iranian Studies Initiative, which is generously funded by the Farhang Foundation, which is the Iranian Cultural Foundation. We're very pleased to have um, our supporters with us this evening, so welcome to you again. Uh, and so this is, as I said, the second annual lectureship. We, uh, we plan to do this uh, at just every year. And we're very pleased this year to have with us such a distinguished scholar, uh, in this case a scholar of film, cinema, Iranian film cinema, uh, Professor Kenny Nafisi. Professor Nafisi, as you see from the um, slide here, is a professor at Northwestern University. He is the professor of radio, television, film, and also a named professor at the Sheikh uh, Hamidin Khalifa Thani, professor of communication. Um, he is a world-renowned scholar of Iranian film, uh, and a documentary filmmaker himself. He has numerous books which have been captivating in terms of work on particularly filmmaking in diaspora or filmmaking in exile. His magnum opus uh, is a, an amazing four-volume wonderful in interacting with Professor Nancy over the last, uh, last year or so, learning more about the way that he goes about his research. It's just the degree to which he has, it's just sort of the, the, the consummate field researcher, kind of very close to my own heart, someone who has really spent time on the ground talking to people, uh, watching all the films, going into the archives, um, with a variety of places, looking across time, uh, it's a wonderful sort of combination of anthropological and, uh, and, and cinematic and critical studies. So uh, it's been my pleasure to be to be a better than this. And now we offer you that opportunity as well. So um, please join me in welcoming Professor Hamid Nafisi. Thank you very much, Laurie, for that very nice introduction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate it, and I also want to thank the Farhang Foundation for invitation. Um, this has been a very interesting, condensed period. Um, so tonight, uh, uh, I think as I mentioned last night very briefly, the, my talk uh, today really focuses on um, Iran and the U.S. in particular, but Iran and the West have not had any um, uh, official diplomatic relations uh, since the uh, revolution and the hostage crisis, uh, crisis and so forth. And so, um, nevertheless, there has been relation between them, and this relation has either been in uh, deep secrecy um, with its own uh, bizarre uh, uh, manifestations like the Iran-Contra, uh, affair, uh, or uh, the relationship has been in plain sight via the media. Uh, uh, since 1979, if any, uh, I'm sure all of uh, you Iranians here have uh, tracked uh, in different ways the way Iran is being portrayed and Iranians are being portrayed uh, in the media. And uh, so my, my, uh, my uh, uh, presentation today focuses on this media relationship between Iran and the U.S., but not just between the two governments, but also between the Iranians who are living at home, Iranians who are in diaspora, um, and uh, the American media. So there's a kind of a five-partner dance that has been going on in, via the media um, in talking uh, to people that you're not supposed to talk to. Um, so, um, and I'm going to show you some film clips, some audio uh, examples, and those of you who, we are, who are not old enough, you will see things that, and hear things that you haven't seen before, perhaps. And those who have seen them will be reminded once again of uh, 
the complicated relationship that we've had. With the technological and digital communication revolution of the past four decades, the dismantling of the Soviet Union, the triumph of global capitalism, and the, and the rise of militant Islam and global terrorism, the standard definition of public diplomacy, which during the Cold War applied mainly to relations between sovereign states, whereby states attempted to communicate with the peoples of the enemy state no longer suffices. And I will illustrate some of these things in just a few seconds. Um, instead, a new public diplomacy has arisen that applies to emerging trends in international relations where pow powerful non-state actors, such as supranational organizations like the UN, subnational actors, non-governmental institutions, the various NGOs, and commercial companies, among them television and film um, uh, and news organizations, communicate and engage meaningfully with foreign publics and thereby develop public diplomacy policies and practices of their own. This new public diplomacy is still largely guided by sovereign states, but by associating multilateral public diplomacy with multiple publics through diplomacy, culture, media, cinema, technology, and advertising, the new public diplomacy is potentially more democratic, empowering, and effective than the binary hierarchical state-to-state -state public diplomacy of the past. I won't read too long, don't worry. Uh, by, that, by the same token, this new public diplomacy is more insidious to detect, more open to government manipulation, and more difficult to counter, for it has insinuated itself rhizomatically and panoptically throughout the formal and informal public and private institutions and formations of society, politicizing, instrumentalizing, and even militarizing them all, we are really, really living in, in the age of militarized culture, a militarization of culture. Um, these are all the various groups that are involved in public diplomacy, subnational actors, non-governmental organization, think tanks, pressure groups, lobbyists, commercial companies, and so on and so forth. Um, and these are the five groups that are talking to each other via the media. I'm, I, some time ago I coined this term media work and I, it sort of this follows uh, Freud's uh, um, 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 term of dream work. According to him, Dream work is the, pro is the, is the way uh, that, the, that the dreams are produced um, through um, the, the, a process that your brain uh, incorporates all of the day's events and various subconscious and unconscious elements and incorporates them into uh, uh, some sort of a coherent narrative that then, uh, that then becomes the dream. And my uh, t terminology talks about the totality of the media that we are exposed to on multiple hundreds of channels that are on cable and on satellite and on, uh, and on uh, our cell phones and our internet and so forth. To consider all of these together as, as media work, the way the media work to create a certain kind of consciousness amongst us that is very different from people who were living at the time when there were no media or there was only one, uh, uh, one medium or when uh, the American, you know, you can't believe it that in the 60s and 70s there were only three networks, uh, uh, television networks in this country. But now that you have so many uh, networks that are going on at the same time, these create a certain kind of um, um, Consciousness, I'm referring to the combined operation of signifying institutions, pop culture, broadcast media, cinema, internet, fashion, music, theater. All of these work to produce a certain kind of image of the other. In, in the case of Iran, for example, stereotyping, demonizing, satirizing, jingoism, commodification, selling products. Um, and I'll show you examples of how Iran, uh, hating Iran becomes a product. 
uh, becomes a commodity that is sold uh, tremendously. Uh, in this way, Iran becomes socially subjected as a sign system and is made commercially productive as a commodity. Iran sells, hating Iran sells, bombing Iran sells. And so people who actually have no political interest necessarily engage in hating Iran and, and, uh, and, and, and so forth. In this way, it is at once controlled in its recognition and dispersed in its commodification. The images and the ideas about hating Iran becomes dominant, widespread everywhere. Um, so let's deal with each of these one at a time. Uh, first, the U.S. public diplomacy uh, in war on terror. Uh, society is militarized um, uh, incredibly. Let me just get to... Um, uh, unlike in authoritarian states like uh, today's Iran or totalitarian states like the old Soviet Union, the media in capitalist country, like the U.S., is not centrally organized and managed by the state. Nevertheless, commercial interests ensure a remarkable degree of homogeneity and unity, especially when it comes to controversial foreign policy issues. Here, media work, that is the combined work of the signifying institutions of society, tend to reproduce a hegemonic ideology about the other. All right. And I'm going to begin with an early example and sort of historically come forward to today's time to show you the U.S. public diplomacy. Um, um, the U.S. public diplomacy in Iran really became, um, became um, uh, I think, very prominent in the early 1940s. The war, Second World War had not ended yet, and as, uh, the, 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 the vice consul or the assistant to the cultural attaché of uh, America in Tehran, Nila Kram Cook, became the head of censorship in Iran. An American diplomat became the head of censorship in Iran. She became the head of Edare Nemayashat, where all the theater uh, uh, companies that wanted to uh, put on a play, all the movie uh, uh, um, companies that wanted to exhibit films in Iran had to uh, get permission from this uh, office, and she was in charge of it. I went through a lot of archival research, and I described that in volume two of my book. Um, and... Uh, um, it's interesting that before the end of the war, the Allied powers, the Russia, U.S., and U.K., who were fighting the Nazis, you can see by looking at, at, at this volume two of my book and the archives that I searched, you can see that they were already uh, um, beginning to uh, define themselves as enemies of each other. The Americans and the British were already beginning to suspect Russia, Soviet Union as the enemy after the war. And they were competing with, with Soviet Union for the, for the minds and hearts of Iranians. The British Council was sending uh, mobile film units across the country showing British films. The Americans were doing the sim similar thing, and I'll explain that more, uh, more fully later. And the Russians had established... Um, branches of the um, uh, of, uh, of the Sovkino um, um, uh, uh, organization in Iran under the rubric of Iran Soviet uh, Friendship Society, uh, very much like the Americans had Iran America uh, um, culture society, where they taught languages and so forth, but they also showed films. And they they uh, there's a great deal of documentation as to what kinds of films were shown they were showing and how they tried to fight each other via the kinds of films that they were showing in Iran. The, as I said the, the, last night, the, uh, the, 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 the American consul in Tabriz would write to the uh, Secretary of State, and the letters are there, that uh, last night the Soviet Union showed a film, the Soviet Union uh, uh, society showed a film on Stalin. Uh, we need... Uh, immediately a couple of uh, Disney films so we can counter, we can counter the, the Soviet films. And uh, the British Council had very good documentation of audience research after each film showing 
to see which film was more successful. They found out that in, in Kerman Shah, for example, people were really much more interested in films about tractors than about uh, Hollywood romances and so forth. <coughs> Because that's the kind of, you know, they, they, they were rural people and they were interested in that kind of stuff. So the second step in the, in the, in the historical uh, trajectory of U.S. involvement in public diplomacy in Iran was to establish a documentary film lab uh, uh, production unit in the 1950s. At the same time that the U.S. was, in 1953, working to... Um, uh, um, to, to get rid of uh, Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953. During the same very years, the Americans were, uh, they sent a, a team to come to Iran, a team that was headed by a Syracuse University professor. Uh, and it, 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 was, it was, since then, then it was known as Syracuse team. He brought a whole bunch of filmmakers with him to Iran, established a film lab within the uh, Edaria, the Fine Arts Administration, uh, and they uh, established this film lab and brought in a bunch of students, Iranian students, and began training them in documentary film production. Uh, um, by the time, by 1957, when the, 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 uh, um, uh, the Syracuse team left Iran, 402 newsreels had been produced in Persian called Akbar Iran, Iran News, and these were basically seven to ten minute news, uh, newsreels that were uh, shot and filmed and edited by Iranians in Persian and, brought, and shown in uh, movie houses across the country before the main uh, features. Uh, those of you who are old enough may remember something like that. Uh, they also produced 400 documentaries in Persian on various topics of public health and development, um, uh, rural development, and those sort of things. Um, um, it's a huge effort. 802 films made in Persian within three, four years. Um, um, this is a picture of Neela Karam Cook. She was a very uh, romantic, very quixotic person. She uh, um, uh, her archive is at the University of Iowa. I went through her archive. She uh, um, uh, uh, became enamored of Gandhi, went uh, and uh, went to uh, Gandhi and stayed in his ashram for uh, quite some time. Uh, she uh, um, learned Persian, uh, became enamored of Iranian traditional dances and folk tales. She learned Persian. She converted to Islam. It's reputed that she translated the Quran, um, and she became the head of censorship. Uh, after, after she finished with the censorship, she uh, established the ballet corps uh, in Iran and hired uh, and, and, and performed Iranian the, the ballets that she herself had created based on Iranian themes of Leili and Majnun and various things of that sort. It's a very interesting um, uh, 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 character. Um, USIA films. So those films, that for, the 802 films were usually called USIA films This because the uh, United States Information Agency was the agency that created the Syracuse team and made the films. Um, they also um, uh, provided Iran with 40 mobile film units. Uh, and these film units would come to universities, to towns, to schools and uh, show films. Uh, at the age of nine, I saw some of those films in elementary school. I have a notebook that contains 16 film reviews that I wrote of the USIA films. This one is about Peyvan Zadan, about uh, grafting, grafting in trees. This is about some other topic. Uh, you can see my, my teacher says, Heili Khubas, very good. <laughs> He's great at my, uh, my thing. Uh, as you can see, I've written the end at the end of each of my reviews in the same way as you see the end appearing in the movies. Big letters, thick letters, and so forth. Maybe the bug of cinema entered me at that point. So the USIA project of winning hearts and minds seems to have worked, at least in my case. 
Um, um, maybe that's why I went to cinema, I don't know. Um, but uh, what happened? I don't have some, I had some other pictures as well of, the, of this mobile film unit coming into, uh, the, 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 the driver would drive into the schoolyard, he would get out of the uh, car, bring out the projector, hung the, uh, the, the curtain in, the, in our uh, 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 library, and he would, he would become a projectionist and he would show films. Sometimes he would bring somebody to narrate to, or to provide expert advice about what was going on. Very interesting story um, uh, of, the CIA, of the USIA film program in Iran. Um, after the revolution, things got very uh, um, um, uh, tricky. Uh, in the US, there was this um, the, uh, the theory developed um, by Bernard Lewis and others, um, and uh, Huntington um, as well, about the clash of civilization between Islam and the West. War on, the, on terror also sort of magnified and played on that. Um, um, uh, uh, of course, Iran had taken 50 Americans hostage for 444 years in their own embassy in Tehran. So Iranians began to be recognized by various President Carter calling them hostage takers, Reagan calling them barbarians, W calling them axes of evil. Uh, at the time that actually uh, the Iranians were helping the Americans in Afghanistan to get rid of Taliban. And that completely undermined uh, Khatami, who was at the time helping um, the, the, the Americans. Uh, so as you can see, things are getting really tight and, and, and rather woolly, as they say. Um, the Americans began to fund opposition media um, in Los Angeles and elsewhere. Uh, in 2006, U.S. Congress allocated 65, uh, $65 million already, and Condoleezza Rice asked for more. Uh, no, sorry, the Congress had allocated $10 million to uh, uh, counter Iran campaign, propaganda campaign against Iran. Condoleezza asked for the rest of the money, so they received $85 million to do that. The Americans uh, launched or extended the hours of Persian services of VOA and of Radio Farda, which is, he which is headquartered in, 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 in Prague. Uh, and Americans began to, uh, very much reminiscent of what Margaret Mead and uh, Gregory Bateson had done during the uh, World War II, um, they began to look at Iranian films to understand something about the mindset of Iranians. Since they, they had no direct access to Iranians, maybe movies would tell us something about what Iranians are thinking. Same thing uh, Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson were doing during the, during the Second World War. They were examining French films and German films to try and understand how the French mind works and how the German minds work. And they wrote uh, um, about this. Um, and so that was another way that cinema became part of the public um, uh, diplomacy. Um, then going to the second part of this uh, enterprise is the U.S. commercial media work uh, uh, about uh, Iran story, so to speak, Iran story. Um, all of these uh, entities that, I am that I'm mentioning here provided uh, uh, fodder for one aspect or other of the Iran story. So to begin with, Iran stories on, the, on TV newscasts. Before the revolution, Iran news coverage was limited. In all of 1972, only 4.6 minutes of the three networks newscasts dealt with Iran. In 73, it went down even. 74 went up a little bit. 75, as we get closer to the revolution, it gets bigger and bigger. By 1977, it's gone to 9.8. 1978, the year before the revolution, it, sh it shoots up to 54 minutes. Yes? I'm sorry, it's, it's, um, is this how many minutes per hour? Or per, per year. Minutes? Per year. Okay. Per year. Sorry, I don't, yeah, I don't say that. It's per year. Minimal. In the 70s, in the whole 1972, there are four minutes, 4.6 minutes of Iran story. Now, watch this. After the American hostages are taken, it goes to 381 minutes. In 1980, after the revolution, 
hostages are still, the hostages were there until the, this, uh, January 20th, 1980. Uh, but Iran was at war. Now it was a big story. Uh, hostages were coming home. So the amount of minutes devoted to Iran news is quite high. Now, what about American hostage stories on the U.S. TV newscast? Nightly newscasts on hostages occupied the largest share of each newscast between November 79 and the end of 1980. That means long after the hostages were released. ABC News had an average of 4.1 minutes of every night devoted to hostages. CBS 3.9, NBC 3.1. Remember that in those days the newscasts were half hour and of that half hour only 20 minutes was news. So out of 20 minutes of news, four minutes of it was about the hostages. It's just an amazing amount. The titles of these, uh, of these shows clearly show the kind of crisis journalism and captivity narrative. Captivity narratives are big narratives in the U.S. history coming from the American Revolution and their contact with the Indians and so forth. A white girl gets captive by the Indians and then that's the end. So that's the same kind of captivity narratives that, uh, that you can see in these titles. Iran, the Desperate Dilemma, America Held Hostage, that was the program that then became Nightline. For a, almost uh, six months or so, it was called America Held Hostage. Crisis in Iran, the turmoil spread. You can see the crisis developing. Where do we go from here? The failure of American rescue mission, year of captivity, families held hostage, ordeal, heroes, and homeward bound. That's when they're beginning to come back to the U.S. Home at last. It's a very dramatic uh, um, way of titling. And during the entire period of the hostage crisis, there was a graphic behind newscasters that count the number of days in captivity. Day 53, he would say that. Walter Cronkite would end his newscast, and that's, and that's the way it is on the day on the, the 58th day of the hostage crisis. Every night he would end his newscast by counting the number of days they were held hostage. And of course this image of the blindfolded American being shown. It is very inflammatory in many ways. I mean it was a terrible thing to do to take Americans hostage. It was illegal, criminal, all of those things. But this kind of sensationalism also worked to create a uh, very negative, kind of a nightmarish life for Iranians. One exclusive interview with Khomeini placed CBS's 60 Minutes on top of the rating chart uh, where it stayed for years. And it was a you know, very economically, very um, productive thing for CBS. It generated $70 million profit for CBS, causing program executive producer to call it perhaps the most profitable broadcast of any kind ever on the air. But the, the most the remarkable thing was what the pop culture did with the hostage story. So here's one example. You know what makes me sick coming home from work and turning on TV and seeing 60 of our people held captive in our embassy. I mean, we buy them the food
Okay, you get the point, right? It's <laughs> Some of them are saying literally that. Uh, oh, here's another one. Um, Supposed to be Persian, right? Dear Mr. Ayatella, we know you call us yellow, and you'd like to see us crawling in the bound at your feet. You think you're so darn bad, but when Uncle Sam gets mad, there's going to be an oil slick right where Iran used to be. Cause we could take our BB gun, blow your buns to the sun, just our boy scout could wipe you out. <laughs> <laughs> Someday soon, oh meanie, you'll burn one flag too many. Uncle Sam's got his pride. You're about to feel his clout. <laughs> the Shaw is our old friend, and we're proud to save his skin. And Cole meanie, you can't blackmail the good old USA. We hope the sand you eat fills your stomach like our wheat. And you can shove your oil up your only holy place. <laughs> yeah, we could take our BB gun, blow your buns to the sun. Just our boy scout could wipe you out. <laughs> Someday soon, oh meanie, you'll burn one flag too many. Uncle Sam's got his pride and you're about to feel his clout. All right. Uh... Many different elements of pop culture came to work on this process. Bumper stickers, fuck Iran, circular keychain, bomb Iran, love keychain, fuck Iran, dartboard, stick a hola in the Ayatollah, <clears throat> dartboards. Toilet papers. <laughs> the Simpsons. Ayatollah Asahola on his t shirt. I mean, they're just amazing. Everybody was in on this game. Um, so, famous joke cycle, right? How many Iranians does it take to screw in a light bulb? Any answers? 100. One to screw in the 99 to hold the house hostage. How many ayatollahs does it take to screw in a light bulb? None. There weren't any light bulbs in the 13th century. How many Iranians does it take to change a light bulb? Six million and one. One to change the bulb, and six million to shot death to General Electric. <clears throat> I mean, there was uh, everyone and everything was working on this topic. Ayatollah would be uh, amazed to hear that you know a story in the in the porn magazine Penthouse uh, was about Iran, the hostage mania. Uh, everybody was doing things. And this is the good one. Bond. This is probably what what's his name was talking, uh, referring to, right? Uh, John McCain, right? The song.
All right, so the, the pop culture is really gung-ho. Everywhere you go, there is this stuff going on. Hollywood also got on, uh, got on this with this famous film. I'm sure all of you have seen that. Um, it's a story by, uh, uh, based on Betty Mahmoudi, who was the wife of uh, Dr. Mahmoudi, an Iranian doctor, who took his wife and daughter to Iran after the revolution. While, and while there, he sort of had a crisis of conscience and became Islamic and began to uh, behave the way all, Muslim, all hardline Muslims are supposed to behave in the stereotype. So he began to imprison his wife at, at home and um, uh, force her to wear the hijab and you can't go out, you can't talk to men, blah, blah, blah. And, and this became an a, 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 a incredibly powerful indictment of Iran. Immediately a film was made of it, Betty Mahmoudi became an ambassador for for uh, the U.S. government to go abroad and to talk about uh, Iran. The S Sally Jesse Raphael, I don't know how many of you remember her, she was a talk show host. She had a show in which she invited the wives of s six, Iran six, uh, uh, Musl six American wives who had married Muslim men, Iranian, uh, Saudi Arabians, various other men and all of whom had divorced their shitty husbands and were complaining about, uh, about them. And it was, you know, as though that's the way Muslim men are. And here we go, here are three, uh, six uh, um, perfect uh, uh, evidences for it. So here's uh, a piece of this, and not without my daughter. A trailer for it. Don't fight over me, girl. You know, I was born in Persia. Well, they call it Iran now. Maybe it scares me. All I want to do is go for two weeks with you and Matab and visit my family. In 1984, Betty Mahmoudi's husband took her and her daughter to Iran to meet his family. It's all changed. He swore they would be safe. I know it's a different culture. I just don't understand it. He swore they would be happy. He swore they'd be coming home soon. Bernhardt, you haven't packed anything. You want me to do it for you? No. He lied. I don't know how to say this to you. We're not going back. We're staying here. I want us to live in Iran. Are you crazy? We're Americans. Your daughter's American. I know it's the right decision if you just give it a chance. No, you won't stay here. You can't. Are you listening to me? You're in my country now. You're my wife. You do as I say. You understand me? If you marry an Iranian man, you automatically become an Iranian citizen. I told you before, you don't touch the phone and you don't leave the house. The laws regarding women are very strict. It is your duty to tell your husband everything. You cannot have secrets. You have no rights to the children. I'll be with you. I'll help you. If they catch you trying to escape with your daughter, they could execute you. There are three principal ways out of here. I promise you I won't leave you. You'll never see my father again. Do you understand me? Dear Lord, hear our prayer. Please help us leave Iran and get back to America. Please let nothing separate us. And keep us always safe in your care. You're gonna kill me! You're gonna kill me! We must go now. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer proudly presents Academy Award winner Sally Field in the terrifying true story of a mother and her daughter whose only crime was being American. I love my baby! Not without my daughter. And there were a lot of films uh, in the in the in, in the 80s uh, and 90s that had to do with terrorism that, in one way or another, had their genesis in Iran or with Iranians or 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 or, or something like that. Um, then the internal public diplomacy 
uh, in Iran. Uh, what shape did that take? In the, in the 1980s, detecting a cultural assault, this is what the Iranians called it, by the U.S. to foment a soft revolution against itself, the Islamic Republic authorities and official media routinely referred to the U.S. as the great Satan. During, uh, uh, during Khomeini's time, and Khomeini colorfully uh, labeling the U.S. the great Satan, and Ahmadinejad calling them the... Uh, the global arrogance, um, um, and Iranians colorfully also talked about the Velvet Revolution and then cultural NATO. Um, um, uh, the, the American public diplomacy, they termed cultural NATO. Uh, the real NATO is with power, with hot, with hot, with uh, hot war equipment. Cultural NATO is with soft power. Uh, lots of images of the Shah as the great Satan. Uh, in this case, you can see the Satan behind him. Uh, Uncle Sam um, being strangulated by a hand of a uh, fist of a collective Iranians. Jimmy Carter as a scarecrow on fire. Uh, lots of uh, graphic works against the U.S., uh, the Statue of Liberty as a, as a death mask, um, murals everywhere. The American uh, flag is weaponized. Uh, the fists crushing U.S. flag and Congress on a former U.S. embassy wall. Um, The, uh, the real debate about the cultural in, uh, uh, invasion of Iran or, uh, and about the politicization of culture by foreigners emerged in 1991 uh, when the, governan, uh, the, the governing right-wing faction charged that an, an organized, multifaceted Taho Farhangi cultural assault was being waged um, uh, against the country by Western imperialism. It charged that the Western and foreign foes, along with their, and this is important, along with their domestic and diasporic fifth column collaborators, intellectual reformists and diasporic media makers and political factions were targeting Iran and its Islamic hate values, not directly by political and military means, but by the more potent hidden weapons of cultural transmogrification. So the hardliners, turned on these so-called collaborators. These are still American flags. You see how, how militarized the American representation in Iran has become and how American flag has become a, uh, a, a carpet to walk on and to desecrate. Um, this is Imam Hussein fighting his nemesis, the Shamr, but the Shamr keeps changing. At this point is Barack Obama behind the sham right here. This is the half of the image of the sham is taken away to show that behind the mask it's actually Obama. Uh, here is Ariel Sharon instead. Here is Netanyahu. So these are all the enemies that Imam Hussein is going to slay. <coughs> um, so hardline has turned on the so-called collaborators. Many high-ranking political figures and most of the, the press participated in this anti-American debate in Iran. The language was strident and alarmist. Khomeini, for example, analogized this cultural assault to a new weapon, a chemical bomb launched by the West to undermine the Islamic regime and its values, a weapon that, as he said, works silently, invisibly, and imperceptibly. Uh, So the, 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 uh, the government in Iran began to uh, produce uh, um, programs for foreign, lang for foreign audiences. Um, one of the early programs was a program called Aftab, a two-hour program that was broadcast in Los Angeles on Sundays at the time that all Iranian programs, television programs, were anti-Islamic Republic. This was the only um, sort of pro-Islamic, although they were not pretending 
they were pretending that they were not funded by the Islamic Republic. Um, um, Iranian Persian language satellite TV channel Jama Jam came out, the, the press TV in English came out, Al Alam in Arabic came out, so Iranians began to uh, to uh, create uh, lots of different channels to reach uh, foreign audiences to, to uh, convey Iranian government's uh, attitudes. Um, within the country, they went after the um, the the, the uh, the domestic fifth columns and so forth. Um, um, uh, they attacked U.S., Israel, Western media, um, the intellectuals, NGOs, media workers, anybody. They arrested periodically filmmakers who worked for BBC, um, the people who worked for VOA. Um, um, a program called Hobiyat or Identity um, or Secret of Ar Armageddon. Uh, uh, what is it? The, for the original is uh, Asrare. Asrare. Wow, what the heck was it called? Asrare. Uh, a very scary program um, <laughs> that lambasted U.S. public diplomacy and its internal opposition in Iran. Um, um, the identity program also went after intellectuals, accusing people of having worked for the for the foreign governments. Um, uh, really, very um, uncomfortable uh, programs. Um, government also began to take over ownership and control of broadcast media within the country. Revolutionary Guard took over the majority of the ownership of the telecom, so that they could, in, in 2009. Uh, to Iran Telecom so that they could uh, filter and control um, um, uh, internet availability in Iran. There was a discussion, serious discussion, of creating a halal internet um, um, by the government. Um, um, uh, um, so the, 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 the fourth uh, leg of this dance, uh, the, uh, the opposition press began to work. Um, very interestingly, uh, let me see where am I. The identity program, for example, charged all kinds of NGOs being uh, in the pockets of Americans. They um, they not only attacked individual authors but also cultural foundations outside the country, which promoted and celebrated Iranian history, culture. The accused Foundation for Iranian Studies, Mahavi Foundation, Kion Foundation, and Par Foundation, all of these as being in the pockets of American public diplomacy uh, to fight Iran. Um, Iranians within the country began to publish all kinds of newspapers, magazines, blogs. Uh, as I said last night, the CIA in 2005 established that Iran was the fifth largest Persian was the fifth largest language in the blogosphere. Um, uh, Iranians, uh, as I la showed last night, developed all kinds of professional organizations to defend their own causes, the, uh, 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 to defend the newspapers, to write letters to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, um, uh, president complaining about uh, censorship and jailing of people. Uh, underground music, underground group, uh, underground raves, all of these things developed. A whole uh, underground culture began to develop, um, uh, as well as a kind of dual culture. The culture within the home was very different from culture outside. Uh, people within the home did all kinds of stuff, including brewing alcohol and drinking and dancing and mixing and doing all kinds of things, while in public everybody was um, um, very proper. Uh, supposedly, and so this culture of dualism was, actually, I think, a very traumatic. This, the, the kids, the children, were told uh, in schools to rat on their parents. If uh, do, the, your, do your parents drink? Uh, do they dance? Uh, do uh, do they do mixed couples come? Do they take their head uh, hijab off or not? All kinds of uh, children became sort of uh, um, uh, pawns in the game of adults. Uh, in schools, they were asked to do that, and at home, they were. They told not to say anything and to hide. 
So, uh, and you can see this in some of the feature films that come out of Iran. Like somebody was asking about Asghar Farhadi's films. Why is he focusing on lying so much? Because I think uh, people, this dual, this dual culture, which has existed in Iran for centuries, was really magnified and, and instrumentalized during this period uh, with, uh, I think, all kinds of terrible consequences. Um, um, but the underground life really is very powerfully present uh, in Iran, and, and no one knows about Persian Cat. The film, for example, is by Mangobadi's account of a, an underground group trying to recruit members to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to perform. Um, um, internal opposition also got involved in public diplomacy through um, their cinema, through film that I talked about last night. Um, um, the government, uh, you know, basically condemned a lot of filmmakers, a lot of writers to internal exile by, pre by censoring them. Many of them went into external exile, as you can see. Um, amongst the films that were, that were made in internal exiles, uh, for example, is Jafar Panahi and Mirtah Mosp's film, which I'm sure most of you have seen. I'm going to show you just a bit of it here. Uh, it's a, he was under uh, a house arrest uh, uh, for having uh, filmed the, uh, the Green uh, uh, Movement, uh, and uh, he was condemned to uh, 20 years house arrest. Uh, and uh, um, forbidden from interviewing to foreign press uh, and, and forbidden from making films. Um, as a result, the filmmaker appears on camera and so hires somebody else to do the filming so that he could get around the, 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 the prohibition. Uh, somewhere in the middle of the film, uh, Panahi says to uh, uh, Mushtaba, uh, why don't you stop filming for a second? Uh, and Mushtaba says, you can't direct. You can't tell me what to do. Uh, I'm the director. So you know, they know they, what the game is and they're playing the game. So this is part of the, the continuation of the discussion of last night. How do Iranians make films, you know, very bold films under very trying conditions? It's, it's amazing. It's part of that cultural duality, perhaps. Um, so here, He's forbidden from filming, making films, so he hires somebody else to film for him. He can't go out to film, so he films inside his house. And he uses very uh, small cameras. ریخ <laughs> پشت دوربین اینجاست صدای تلفن میاد با اینکه ناراحت است قرار بود که آدم تعریف کنه که فیلم نمیسازه <تصفيق> توی اون لوکیشن که حالا من چهار تا خط کشیدم چی رو میتونم با اون که نمیشه صحبت حداقل بیان با موبایل میشن به کاری کنن See, he's uh, condemned to, uh, to house arrest, and yet he is in contact with the world, on TV, on radio, on, uh, on, on his cell phone, and so forth. So this was uh, smuggled on a USB stick, I'm told, in a birthday cake out of Iran. I don't know how the hell somebody would take a birthday cake out of Iran. 
<laughs> but uh, <coughs> and he was taken to uh, European film festivals and did well. Hello, salam khangida. So it's interesting. He's publicly talking about his terms of, uh, of, of imprisonment, how he can finagle out of it, and so forth. It goes on and on. Uh, amongst other Iranian um, 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 uh, opposition was the development of what I'm calling, you know, internet cinema. I talked about it earlier in, in, in one of the sessions whereby Iranians would upload uh, um, activist videos to the internet and then other people would use this uh, uploaded material to make other materials from it. And of course the most famous case is the, is the case of Neda Agha Sultan. This is the C CNN report uh, of it. Um, I'm sure this report you includes graphic content. Your discretion is advised. The cliché is that a picture is worth a thousand words. Images of Nada laying on the street in a pool of blood sparked a wave of sympathy for demonstrators worldwide. Our senior editor of uh, Middle East Affairs, Octavia Nasser, has more about her and the reaction her So you see how the footage the that's world. uploaded is being used. Some of the images you are about to see are disturbing. Her name is Nada. The facts surrounding her life and her death difficult to verify. She appears to have been a young student who joined thousands of her countrymen to voice her disapproval of Iran's election results. Eyewitnesses say Basij militiaman hiding on a building rooftop shot Nida in her chest, silencing her forever. A man who appears to be her father, desperately calling on her to open her eyes. A stranger begging her to stay awake. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, Nada, the man says. But Nada doesn't respond. She dies right there on the street, another protester capturing her last moments on a cell phone camera. And just like that, Nada, who came to the square thinking she's one voice among thousands, turned into the voice of an entire opposition movement. Nada, which means the calling, is now on millions of lips across the globe on the internet in specially designed avatars, a young life cut down in its prime, one woman's gripping story speaking volumes, a grim reminder of the price Iranians could pay for freedom. Octavia Nasser, CNN, reporting. Now her story became, of course, you know, global, and an animated film came out, uh, the, the documentary came out, the f fictionalized film came out. She became really a, very, a, a cause celebre in many ways. But if you look at the actual camera, raw footage from the camera, it's really very powerful. It, it doesn't have all the form formatting and all the um, intro introductory and voiceover stuff that may uh, sort of diminish the power of the footage. Uh, Let's 
Pretty powerful, no? Uh, the fact that she was beautiful, she was young, she dressed Western, uh, she was not involved. Uh, um, all of these really helped to turn her into a symbol uh, that could be identified by, by Westerners. Um, um. Uh, what the hell? None. The Basijis will sit in the dark and blame Israel and USA. <laughs> <clears throat> so the last uh, part of this uh, uh, on the dance group is the uh, Iranian in diaspora. Um, the Iranians in diaspora uh, is estimated to be roughly three million educated, media savvy uh, people living in exile. Il Iran is the largest brain drain country in the world. That's what. Uh, um, UN determined in 2004 uh, exporting about 150,000 of its best and brightest minds abroad annually. Now on average, this is in 2004, now it has gone up to 180,000 educated people leaving the country every year. Uh, it is also probably the country with the most foreign and exiled media aimed at it. Um, in my book on uh, the Iranian exiles, I, I showed how uh, active the Iranians in diaspora were. Um, multiple broadcasts, cable casts, lease access programs in, tele uh, uh, in Los Angeles were being produced. Then came commercial television channels, over 20 of them in Los Angeles al alone. There are also anti-Islamic Republic group broadcasting like uh, Mujahideen, um, a program that for many years came out of bro broadcast out of I out of uh, Iraq into Western Iran and also broadcast in the U.S. Um, um, there were also oppositional um, film screenings. I showed some examples of it last night. Some flyers for them. Um, um, Iranians, of course, in exile in response to all of this negative imagery of Iran acted uh, defensively using subterfuge, hiding, passing, all of those things. They changed their names, adopted English nicknames, some dyed their hair blonde, some denied Iranian origin, some claimed that they were Greek, Italian, Mexican, you know, various uh, whatever, but Iranian. Um, some began to call themselves Persian instead of uh, 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 Iranian. Um, I don't know why I have two per uh, Persia and Persian, that's right, yes. Um, and many Iranian filmmakers began to make films. I, these are some of the categories that I um, have identified, uh, exile films, diasporic films, emigre films, ethnic films, and finally, cosmopolitan films. Cosmopolitan Iranian filmmakers are those who claim not to be Iranian or anything. They're just filmmakers, like Amir Naderi or Sohrab Shahid Saleh, who make great films and they're not about Iran, not, uh, and they don't want to be known as Iranian filmmaker. They want to be known as filmmaker, period. But the others are exilic, diasporic, and so forth. I won't go into that. It's a long story. If you want, I will explain more fully, and many of their films you have seen, I'm sure, in Los Angeles. The newer kind of developments are, I want to talk about those, and that's the development of music videos as, a, as, a, as an expressive medium. Um, and uh, um, uh, they were very powerful also, um, combining, uh, you know, f fast cutting and beautiful imagery of music videos with the music and dance, danceable tunes and hard, uh, 
hitting lyrics. Uh, one example is the is the which also this example uses the footage from the Iran uh, uh, Green Revolution, um, the, the image that is uh, the, uh, the video that is uploaded to uh, to the internet. They use basically the film. The video shows two uh, stories taking place. One is a uh, is a person who's trying to upload a revolutionary anti-government uh, uh, video um, um, onto internet, and another is this band that is playing, trying to receive. Uh, the stuff. So it's a very uh, timely intervention in uh, in the process. And here is so here is in Tehran. Trying to bring the lights down, maybe. See how it works. It's a little bit better, yeah. PhD students, remember what uh, Althusser said about interpolation? Anybody remember? When does that happen? Yeah, when the police, very good. When the police in the street, you're walking and somebody from behind you, the police, sorry, this light is playing. The police shouts and say, hey, you there. You turn around to see who it is who's addressing you. That turning around means that you have become the subject to the authority of the state. And here this video is doing the same thing to the state. It says, hey, you Ayatollah, leave those kids alone. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, reverse action on the, on, on the regime. And there are a number of video uh, uh, 
uh, the, the, that work along those lines or work along the line of improving the, the image of Iranians. And this is interesting because it's all about, it's calling for the disarming, disarmament in the context of Iran and the U.S., but also calling for uh, uh, asking, why are you scared of Iran? Um, and in order to humanize Iranians, it focuses on all kinds of things that Iranians do that are westernized. So that's interesting on that. Iranians are like anybody else. They enjoy picnicking. They enjoy going out with their families. They enjoy playing ball, uh, skating, and, and so on and so forth. Why bomb them? And not only, um, even individuals use the image of Iran for their own benefit, the promotion of their career and so forth. Uh, I think one of the most graphic examples was what was happening in the worldwide wrestling. Um, in the 1980s, worldwide wrestling became very popular. For those of you who live in LA, uh, I was living in LA at the time also, just on Channel 5 all the time they were running um, these programs. And uh, the famous uh, Iranian, the Iron Sheik, uh, was uh, um, uh, almost all of the American ethnic uh, unrest and differences and fighting and so forth were being played out on the uh, wrestling ring. Um, <clears throat> There was a group uh, called the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, GLOW. These were all Barbie doll girls, beautiful, tall, uh, and so forth. They fought each other in bikinis and so forth. One of them was called Palestina. She was a Palestinian Barbie doll who wore khaki and boots and kicked the, kicked the other Hollywood girls unfairly. Another one was called Vine. The other one was called Hollywood. You know, they were playing the, uh, the, the, the Palestinian uh, blonde games there. The most interesting one was the when the Iron Sheik and the uh, the Russian um, wrestler Vol Volkov were paired together and formed the Foreign Legion, um, fighting uh, basically white Americans, uh, Sergeant Slaughter, uh, Hulk Hogan, and those kinds of people. And uh, Iron Sheik claimed. Uh, 
um, that he had been the bodyguard of the Shah. And he um, would uh, oftentimes wear uh, an Arab headdress or wear uh, shoes that, uh, whose toes turned up uh, and over, like the, some of the Arab uh, um, in fantasy films you see uh, them wearing. And sometimes he would, walk, he would come into the rink with a camel, on a camel. Sometimes he, was, he would carry the, 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 the flag of Iran and cause the, the, the young audience, and I went to some of these wrestling games just to, for research purposes. <coughs> uh, mind you, only for research. Um, uh, he, would, uh, <coughs> he would cause the young, hot-blooded uh, the men, and the, the audience was majority men, to shout, Iran sucks, Iran sucks, and he would just goad them to do this. It was really amazing. So here he is having a problem with one of his rivals, and he goes nuts, as the, literally, as you will see here. It's very profane, I'm sorry, but in the interest of scholarship, <laughs> you have to tolerate some things. Yes, yeah, so. Fast forward one year to 1987, WrestleMania three. The Pontiac Silverdome, Pontiac, Michigan, over 93,000 <coughs> fans. You teamed up with Nikolai Volkov to take on the Killer Bees, and that's where your feud began with Hacksaw Jim Duggan when he interfered at the end of that match. What was it like to be in that massive crowd? You asked me an excellent, excellent question. The great feeling all time I had all my life, Mr. Dan Maloney, it was that night. Pontiac, Michigan, Silver Dome. Correct. Which Silver Dome? Pontiac. Yes. Michigan. And that was a great honor, great feeling to wrestling next to 93,000 people. Knowing him. Listen, 93,000 people would go to see wrestling team. I mean, it's just incredible. Conversation, no any football player, no any, no any uh, sport event in your country sold out Madison right. Square Garden. I mean, uh, Pontiac, Michigan, exam wrestler. It was a great feeling, Don Maloney, try wrestling with uh, uh, Jim Brazella and that jabroni, Brian Blair. Brian Blair, right. Brian Blair, you're another faggot son of a bitch. No good, low life. I want to let you know you are punk. You are fat, you are punk, little gay, worse than Michael Jordan, Michael uh, Jackson. <laughs> it was a great feeling. I have a lot of respect for them. His partner, Jim Branzera from Minnesota, great athlete, great high jumper, but that little punk, Graham Blair, another little fat, worse than Michael Jackson. And I didn't like him, I didn't like his attitude. He was a punk. I can break his fucking back, break his back, make him humble, and then fuck his ass. I didn't do it in the Pontiac, Michigan, because I respect my sport and respect Mr. McVeigh. You were a professional. A oh, professional. <laughs> Otherwise, I was, was, was ready to do a dream or country way, make him humble. Suplex him, put him in a camera clutch, break his back, and then fuck his ass, make him humble, to hear the fuck out of it. And I didn't do it because for the God and Jesus and Mr. McMahon. Brent Blair, you are no good. You are worse than Michael Jackson. I will never respect you again. Uh, and then he was lucky to the uh, big man, uh, American 2x4, Hatsa. You was lucky, punk. I didn't break your back to fuck your ass, make you hot. Anyway, he goes on and on. He goes really, literally nuts. That's the... Um, that is him. So uh, the Iranians in exile <coughs> finally came out of the closet. <laughs> with this show. Uh, and they came out of the closet with this show, not as Iranians, but as Persians. Um, and this is part of the, the whole dynamics of self-representation and counter-representation that I've been talking about. You've seen this, uh, no doubt, uh, many times, and love them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's see, just a little bit of it. What is time among friends? We're bringing Persian back, baby. <laughs> We're bringing
bring in Persian back, right? So Iranians finally stopped dyeing their hair, stopped it saying, denying that they were Iranians. Although saying Persian is, for many Americans, they don't know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, Persia is another country, not necessarily, doesn't map out to Iran for many of them. And that's the whole purpose, to, to uh, be something but not Iranian. And that's it's part of the politics of the country. And the result has been interesting. Here's the community's response. Lavish parties, luxurious cars, and a taste for flashy, expensive blame. $6,000. I think I'm just going to have to take this tape. That's why Farm Bravo's Shaws of Sunset has followed six Persian-American friends living it up in glamorous Beverly Hills. It may look similar to other reality programs showcasing the lifestyles of the rich, like the Real Housewives franchise. Gold cars, houses with a big column. But Showbiz Tonight can report that many in the Persian community think this reality show needs a reality check. My first reaction was really disgust. Like former Beverly Hills Mayor Jimmy Delshaw. Born in Iran, Delshaw said he came to the U.S. at the age of 20 and went on to become a successful businessman. He tells Showbiz Tonight he's concerned with some of the behavior on Shaw's and Sunset. As you see, some of them, the girl says, my only paycheck comes from my father. I'm 30 years old and my only paycheck is from my daddy. They're acting as small children. <laughs> I want the people in Middle America to know that the Persians are not like what you see on that show. We love our culture, we love our families, we love our traditions. A few Persians on that show, like Reza Farahan and Mercedes MJ Javid, disagree and tell Showbiz Tonight they are outraged over the outrage surrounding Shaws of Sunset. <laughs> you can't say that you're giving the Iranian-American community a bad name. No. This is an embarrassing <laughs> depiction. We can only make them look better, and they forget they're thinking in this small bubble. They think We've been portrayed yeah. as terrorists. People think we have horns. We're going to humanize them. They need to call us and thank us after the show airs. If Persians think that any representative is going to embarrass them, then that just shows they think that what they're doing out there is embarrassing. We're not going to do that. We are actually totally, like Reza said, we're going to humanize our culture. But Delsha tells Showbiz Tonight many in the Persian community have already seen enough. After the show, I, I got a lot of emails. Most of the emails asked me, can you stop the show? Can you do something? <laughs> that might be tough considering that some, like Delsha, are calling Shaw's the next Jersey Shore. <laughs> MTV's reality TV sensation got slammed from the start for its hard partying, fist pumping cast. Jersey Shore's critics fumed over what they called negative stereotypes of Italian Americans. You look like a walking party. Still, the protests didn't get in the way of making it a phenomenon. It's hard to ignore the Jersey Shore similarities, but Farhan downplays the idea that Shaws of Sunset could negatively impact the Persian community. We're not elected officials, we don't represent anyone but ourselves, and we're really fun, and I think the audience is literally going to be mesmerized. Whether audiences are mesmerized enough to give the show a Jersey Shore or Real Housewives type following remains to be seen. But we can tell you the controversy only seems to be keeping the spotlight right where these new reality TV stars want it. On them. Yep. And then Iranians throughout this, uh, uh, this period re themselves constantly by pulling the, 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 the Achaemenian period uh, uh, to the fore as part of the Iranian identity. And this became really very uh, solid when the cylinder, the, 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 the Cyrus cylinder, um, was discovered and came to, I mean, came to, uh, to be exhibited in... Uh, uh, Smithsonian and later circulated to uh, to several different countries and a film came out about it which is quite uh, interesting I won't go into that I think I will probably show you one or two more and then stop is that okay you know this guy of course but this also he also plays into the Persian uh, as well so the concept of the change of nomenclature from Iran and Iranian to Persia and Persian is is really something that the Iranians in diaspora are, 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 are pushing as a way of differentiating themselves from Iran of the Ayatollahs. 
but, but uh, at the same time reviving a particular kind of Iran prior to Islam and prior to revolution. Welcome, Maz Jabrani. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Maz Jobrani. Uh, I'm an American citizen. I've grown up in America, but I was, I was born in Iran. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's how I feel, right? Yeah. You guys are like, whatever, bro, that's your problem. Deal with it. Yeah, it's not a good time to be from the Middle East. You know, uh, Iranians, we've learned how to deal with it. We've learned how to trick Americans. Uh, we say we're Persian. <laughs> It sounds a lot nicer and exotic and confuses Americans, you know. We're always like, no, no, I'm not Iranian. No, 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 I am Persian. <laughs> like the cat, meow. <laughs> I am the cat, meow. <laughs> I am not access of evil. No, no, I am Persian. Like the rug, I am soft. Hello. <laughs> you can lay down on me. Yeah, and as an actor of Middle Eastern descent, I've done some TV and film, and one thing I've noticed is that uh, um, you tend to die a lot. <laughs> yeah, like I did a Chuck Norris movie, and I knew I was going to die in that. <laughs> it was bittersweet when I got it. My agent called me up and said, you got a film? I'm like, yes! He's like, with Chuck Norris. I'm like, damn! Because <laughs> I'm never going to be a sidekick, right? <laughs> never going to be like Chuck and Hassan saving the world. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> We'll be like, hey, Chuck, you get those guys, I get these guys, see you back at the base. <laughs> and my mom got mad for me dying all the time on TV. She's like, why do you keep dying? <laughs> I'm like, mom, that's how they write the show. She's like, why don't you kill them one time? <laughs> I'm like, I can't just kill them. She's like, yeah, but they're not looking. Bang, get them. <laughs> you are a limp. It's crazy times, too, nowadays, you know, with the war going on. Stuff. I didn't want to go to work because I'm peaceful, you know, but, but I had other reasons I didn't want to go to work because I'm originally from Iran. And Iran sounds a lot like Iraq. And I was worried that if there was one president who was going to mess it up and bomb the wrong country. <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> yeah. George Bush. He's, he's not to go with the alphabet. We all know that. We've seen him. It's like A-B-Q-W-Z-Y-T. <laughs> he never pronounced the country right. He called it Iraq. If I were Saddam, I'd have been pissed. I'd have been like, hey, if you're going to bomb us, at least pronounce it right. It's not Iraq. It's Iraq. Okay, fine. I might be evil, but you are stupid. <laughs> <This guy. laughs> I don't say we're going to war with America. I say America. Come on, George. I'm hooked on phonics. You should be too. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a tough few years for Middle Easterners in America, man. It's been tough. The only good thing that's happened for Middle Easterners the past few years is that the Bush administration went after gays. Yeah, it was good because it took the heat off the Middle East for a minute. Yeah, Middle Easterners were like, yeah, get the gays. Gays are bad. Gays could be terrorists. Al Qaeda? You never know. You know who I felt bad for when the gay marriage amendment debate started? You know there was a gay Arab guy walking around going like, I just can't get a break. <laughs> This is ridiculous. First the Arabs, now the gays. What do you have against me, George Bush? I don't know. I, you know what? I say live and let live, you know, with the whole mar gay marriage amendment. I don't know. Why are we so obsessed with wanting the whole amendment? Look, I'm straight, and I'm afraid of marriage. You want to do an amendment, do a straight marriage amendment. That way, when my girlfriend wanted to get married, I'd be like, look, I'd love to, but it's illegal. I can't. Sorry. But I'm actually, I am, I'm actually going to get married now. I've, I've been with my girlfriend for uh, five years. She's beautiful. She's smart. Everything's great except there's one problem. She's Christian. I'm originally Muslim, but I'm not that religious. And the father said, you can marry anyone you want as long as he's Christian. So I told her, you know what? I said, I'll convert. I said, I'll do it for you. I said, I'll show up one Sunday and do whatever it takes. You know, I'll, I'll eat the cheese and crackers. <laughs> you know, I'll have the wine, whatever. Hallelujah. I'll do all that. But just one Sunday. Once, I can't keep showing up every Sunday. I'm a guy, I got things to do on Sundays. Right, guys? Right? 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 Yeah. Yeah, man. I, you know, I got, I, got, I got things like football. Right? right. Sleeping in. Right? Jihad. 
Thank you, that's my side, my name's Maz Gibrani. Well, I haven't said about the sixth partner in this dance, and that's Israel. So I'm going to show you one video that is it's an ad for Hot TV, which is a cable channel in, in, in Israel. And it, the ad talks about giving anybody who subscribes to this uh, um, network uh, a Samsung tablet. So this, uh, th th I'm telling you this story because it's in Hebrew. I'm not sure how many of you know uh, Hebrew. But anyway, so four Mossad agents uh, walk into Iran in disguise, terribly bad disguise, because you can clearly see they are men. Nevertheless, they're pretending to be women. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and they walk to, uh, to this other Mossad guy uh, who is sitting in a tent and playing with a tablet. Uh, behind him is the Isfahan uh, nuclear research, uh, power research. Uh, and so they, uh, they see this tablet and say, oh, wow, what a fantastic thing. So one of them uh, looks at it and points to um, an app. He says, what is this app for? And you'll see. Wow, is it No, מצטרפים לטריפל שבמבצע, רק ב-329 שקלים לחודש, ומקבלים טאבלט של סמסונג מתנה, בהחזר חודשי קבוע ל-36 חודשים, עם כל התוכניות, להצטרפות כוכבית 6900. Islamic State sweeps through the Middle East, killing anyone who isn't exactly like them. Imagine how dangerous Islamic State would be if it had armored divisions, fighter jets, and ballistic missiles. Imagine Islamic State building atomic bombs. Well, maybe it's not that hard to imagine. The Islamic State of Iran, like ISIS, just much bigger. This is apparently was released June 30, 2015 by Israeli government, tweeted by uh, Israel PM, that's the Netanyahu's office. Official account attempts to erase the distinction between the Sunni Muslim extremists of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria and their own enemies, the Shiite Muslim of Iran. Um, oh, finally, there's one more. You have to watch this. No, this is good. This is good. Watch, 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 watch. I love playing frisbee with my sons. I love the sound of the waves on the Pacific at sunrise. I love curling up with a good book. I love to see my grandkids smile. But if Congress sabotages the nuclear deal with Iran? We could be denied the very moments that make our lives worth living. Why? Because we'd be dead. Super dead. Like totally fried by a major nuclear bomb dead. I won't be able to play frisbee with my sons because there won't even be a frisbee. The frisbee will be melted. We will be melted. Or worse. Toasted? Yes, Natasha, but most people think toast is delicious. This would not be that kind of toast. It'd be like a really dark, unpleasant cloud of death toast. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. We're not actually worried about Iran dropping a nuclear weapon on the United States. Holy shit. 
Is that? Yes, Jack, it's me, Queen Noor from Jordan. Look, it is true that if Congress sabotages this deal, there would be nothing stopping Iran from getting the bomb. That would likely spark an arms race throughout the region. Precisely, Ambassador Pickering. Ultimately, we could be forced into a war with Iran, another dangerous, drawn-out, and expensive conflict in the Middle East with many lives lost. So wait, are you saying that instead of a quick toasting type of death, that in a war with Iran, maybe a lot of people would die much more slowly? Like, like if they were put into, say, an immense crock pot for a really, really long time? Natasha, I don't think you need a surrealistic food metaphor to comprehend the sheer recklessness of a war with Iran. Once the war begins, the chances of Iran developing a nuclear weapon would only increase. Wait a second. That's Valerie Plain. Valerie Plain is in this clipping video. Valerie. Do you know that because you're a spy? I'm not going to answer that question, Jack. I think what Valerie is saying is that the agreement currently on the table is the best way to ensure Iran doesn't build a f bomb. And it gives the international community unprecedented access to verify that Iran is keeping up its end of the bargain. A there is one last one, I promise you. This is when Rouhani came to the U.S. and there was a discussion about whether he should shake hands with Obama or not. So there, this song is about shaking hands. You, brush up on your Persians now. It's called Daspede. Okay, I think it, it goes on and on. Thank you guys for your patience here. Uh, yes, sure. If you could turn up the, the lights, I suppose, <clears throat> I could do that, certainly, yes. Thank you for your patience. This was a long one. I'm sorry. So the floor, the floor is open. I'll, I'll sure. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. So is it the, the kind of you know contingency and contradictions which elude a neat closure that you're suggesting? Because the, the both the diplomacy, the internal diplomacy, which is contesting the criticism by the United States and United States stereotyping of Iran, both of them are eluding a kind of closure. It's a kind of ongoing process right. where improvisation and everyday negotiation seems to be the seems to be suggesting that you know the new new media network is trying to build in a uh, new refashioning of diasporic identity yes yeah i think th all of this uh, did you finish sorry go ahead uh, no so i was just uh, wondering whether where, where do you suggest the notion of exile in this narrative because you know there is a lack of closure there is negotiation constantly with the sense of identity home belongingness and the notion of root so you know, where do you think about the concept of exile right. and the longing to go back right. in this you know, notion of media works? Right. Well, I didn't bring that part into, into this discussion because it, 
it, it, it, it could sidetrack the discussion. But it is for the Iranian diaspora population, um, especially those who feel they are in, in exile, it's very complicated. The, the desire to go back, the impossibility of going back, um, the fact that they are expelled in some cases from Iran, they've lost their, their, their career, their, their uh, properties, and all of those things. So they have anger against uh, Iran, yet they feel nostalgic about the country, about the language, and so forth. They try to recreate some aspects of it here, and they try to deny Iranianness as a way of getting on with life. And then on the other hand, you have a little bit of you know, the, the Persian uh, business coming in is, is a way that the exiles are trying to, to live not only in America and with themselves, but also with the past now by sort of suppressing the contemporary Iran and reviving an older, more glorious Iran of the past. So there is there, uh, that, that, uh, that dynamic of exiles is there, but I didn't... Uh, bring it out because of time. Um, um, but all of the issues, all of the participants are involved in multifaceted, complicated games. And I'm hoping to turn this into a book because it's really, um, um, I just gave you one narrative of this thing, but it's really complicated. Yes. Yeah, please stand. Yeah, that's next. I know it's a little bit off of the conversation, but it seems like I know you have deeper knowledge than most of the rest of us. I, I research this stuff a lot, like on my own. With the looming threat of the Islamic State right now on the world and maybe not just the Middle East, do you think that it changes that that dynamic between us and the U.S. in terms of like having a common enemy? How do you think that they should be reacting with that? Because like I know that Iran has. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a, a political scientist, but I, I, I think there, there, perhaps one of the reasons that the nuclear accord went through was the uh, the, the idea of of maybe getting closer to Iran might help the West to fight the ISIS at some point, uh, in some fashion. And I think that's still um, that is still coming. That 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 poli that policy probably will play out, but I don't know. And, and I think you're absolutely right. ISIS is the common enemy of the, of, of the two countries, and they're bound to. The problem is that both countries having, are having elections, and which means that in both countries, the right wing uh, are coming out of the woodwork uh, uh, against the rapprochement of any sort. And so if we can ride this wave uh, for, for the next six to six months to, to a year, then maybe there would be um, a coalition between U.S. and America against ISIS. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor, for your very insightful presentation. Thank you. Um, it was indeed an honor to be here. Uh, well, in the beginning of your presentation, you just mentioned that uh, well, uh, the Westerners, the Americans, have been trying to find more about the Iranian mindset through uh, the movie productions that have been produced in Iran during the last 30 years from the Revolution onwards. But uh, uh, I cannot agree with this because, uh, well, this is the reality. That's the only choice they have currently. But I'm saying that uh, uh, why not exploring and investigating the social media, which is currently being uh, used by Iranians to, uh, to learn more about the uh, the, the mindset and the culture of people. There was a statement from uh, uh, Barack Obama, uh, which was published by uh, Foreign Affairs, I, think, uh, I, I, I guess, and then uh, they were saying that uh, why uh, outsiders from America should judge America based on Hollywood. And I think the same is true about Iran. Uh, in movies, everything is being exaggerated. So why not using social media as an area for research right. to find about Iran? Right. They are doing that. Um, um, what I was uh, telling you about looking at the movies was before social media had, had, had come online. Social media is very new, basically five years or so s since the social media has become really a force. Um, so you mentioned early 80s. 
Yes, early 80s and 90s, uh, uh, the State Department and, and Defense Departments were looking at Iranian um, uh, films to, to understand more about Iran. I mean, they were trying various things. That was just one way that they were trying to understand. Um, uh, but now social media, of course, give them a tremendous amount of um, information. Um, yeah. Any more? Yes. I think each person will have to do it individually, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, because it is, it is uh, you know, within your own circle. It's a fight uh, uh, that you have to do. Um, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, if you're a writer, if you're a columnist, if you're a journalist, if you're a filmmaker, if you're a novelist, if you're a researcher, all of us in these various fields can a professor, by teaching a class about these topics, can change several minds by sponsoring or, or, or mentoring PhD students who are working on these topics. Uh, you can make a difference. But it's a long-term process. It's a slow process. Uh, um, um, by getting involved in Hollywood, I mean, we have a lot of Iranians who are working in Hollywood. Uh, um, you have to... Um, you have to... Um, Put your money where your, where your mouth is and begin to work on projects that are uh, that, that are meaningful. Of course, the you know changing of stereotypes doesn't mean that you suddenly then go the other way, 180 degrees, and say Iranians are all good and and so forth, because that's just as unrealistic as the other. Uh, so the, the best thing to do is to really present as realistic an, an image as you can. Shahs of Sunset has done one thing to some extent has ameliorated the image of Iranians as terrorists, but at least now we see Iranians are rich kids, they live in Beverly Hills, drive fancy cars, they're gays, they're Jews, they're uh, um, uh, real estate agents, they're, uh, you know, they can have fun, they drink, uh, they're sexy, they're, you know, all of the, <laughs> not all, but some of the qualities of Americanness they have acquired. So it, it, it modifies some images, but it also, creates others, uh, but it'll, it's a long process. Yes? I was wondering if you could briefly comment on the role of brands as an intermediary. Um, for a lot of these films, from as far back as Khomeini being in exile in France and all the mediatic attention being given to him, to who are the distributors, who are the um, cultural, you know, the Cannes Film Festival as a site of, of bestowing Yeah. That plays into the world. That's a good question. Let's get a PhD student to work on that. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, I think the role of France does need to be worked on because French, uh, fr uh, uh, French was such a, uh, had such an inroad in Iran before English um, uh, came into being and uh, when the, the earlier generation of, uh, of Iranian scholars and military people and all of these people went to France for training. The language of education in the uh, early 20th century was French. Um, so the Iranians have a soft spot for France uh, in addition to its romantic, romantic uh, allure and all of that stuff. Um, but France also engaged in real politic uh, in many ways. and. Uh, it also housed the Mujahideen in Iran, in, 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 in Paris. They have had involvements of various sorts with Iranian pol politics. Um, uh, and they had uh, um, uh, French schools in Iran. They had the um, French-Iranian society with lots of languages and films and cultural things. 
going. So there has been a lot of relationship between Iran and France. But I'm not, I have not studied their uh, uh, cultural diplomacy. Um, um, and in all of the work that I did on, on, on Britain, Soviet Union, and the, UK, and the U.S. cultural policy, I did not see very many references to France. That doesn't mean that there hasn't been. Um, um, but that, I think, requires some, some further studies. The, there have certainly been some, uh, like the Marjorie uh, uh, Satrapi's films and, 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 and books have been, I'm not sure whether they have anything to do with her being in France or not. Those are her authorial products, uh, and she could have, if she was an uh, English-speaking person, might have been able to do the same thing in the UK or any other country. I'm not sure that she was aided by the French government in that um, uh, uh, process. Uh, but it's, I think it's worth, uh, it's worth uh, and Cannes Film Festival, I don't think, follows the lead of the French governments in allowing films to come or not to come um, to, 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 to the festival. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it's worth studying, um, but um, that's all I can say. Somebody, I think you had your hand up. Yes, given uh, your knowledge, your expertise, and your research, uh, obviously, you, uh, well, I'm sorry, I should proceed that by saying, as you know very well, Iranian migrants are one of the most successful migrants to the United States in the history of the United States. So given that, and given how the mediatic impacts have been not necessarily in line with the achievements of the Iranians, if you were going to share with us who you'd like or love to have an impact in changing that, one to three things that we could do that would be most impactful in the short term, midterm, and long term, to create that change so that the reality of the success of Iranians would be reflected mm -hmm. in the American culture and society. Right. What would those be? If you haven't thought about that before, please think about it, and by the end of the session, give me the answer. Or if, you are, well, if you're comfortable... I'll give you one answer that I can immediately say. Please. Um, uh, fund uh, professorial chairship at UCLA and at USC and at other major universities because that's, I mean, I'm surprised that UCLA, after Nikki Keddy retired, the, the most famous uh, Iran historian, nothing happened to that. After Ziyai uh, died, nothing happened. None of the Iranian community here put any money in there to, do, to donate uh, for the chair. Hey, of, <laughs> yes, no, I know. No, 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 because UCLA. we're doing it. <laughs> Right. The replacement from getting the chair and also Nikki Kelly's chair was combined with Gav James Gavin's into the Israeli Palestinian uh, study. So it has it is political. Yes. I believe the community, as we have proven with the program here, the community is behind that and they're going to fund it. However, the institution has to have the ability to accept that and do something with it. And USC, in that sense has been a great partner for us and they've allowed us to yes. help them get this going. U UCLA is going through some changes and it's going to take some time, but their political has nothing to do with the community actually right. Good. funding the effort the and the leadership. Yes. Fantastic. So I, I think that's because that brings stability and name recognition to Iranian studies, especially in the center of Iranian community here. I think it's, uh, but also more strategic donation of money it's I think very very helpful it's uh, um, especially private universities universities are in in increasingly going towards a corporate structure unfortunately like everything else in this country so they they understand money and they it's uh, it's it, it's uh, we just received you I was just telling uh, uh, Huh? 
about St. Lawrence and the, uh, the, the, the donation that Northwestern received from uh, the, the Buffett, um, the, the, the wife of uh, Warren Buffett. They received $100 million for global studies. Uh, and so that institute now is beginning to channel some of the money to um, the hiring of an Iranian uh, cultural studies uh, faculty of, uh, of Iran and one in Turkish studies uh, as well. I think giving a large amount of money creates kind of um, uh, a buzz, a kind, a kind of allows to not only hire one person, but also to create an institute or library or uh, funding for graduate research, you know, all of those things that suddenly will bear, uh, would make a big splash, but also it, it will become productive in terms of uh, uh, producing research um, uh, publications and those sort of things. So, um, and also I think Iranians sh themselves should publicize their work. I mean, there have so many scientists, so many artists, so many successful business people um, that are, is there a way to, to make connection at the top level of Iranian uh, uh, around the c country. I'm sure you guys are involved in some of those things, but how, how to publicize these things so that on an annual way and some sort of a um, uh, sort of an Oscar night, I don't mean Oscar as such, but you know, some sort of a big night of recognition of Iranian talent uh, and not just art and music and so forth, but also sciences and um, uh, meteorologies and, po and um, and medicine and uh, and so forth. So I don't know. I haven't thought about it systematically, but in my own sort of academic life, I see that uh, this is when I I, I, st I started the Iranian the, the the Iranian Film Festival at UCLA in 1990. It came at, under a huge amount of attack by I Iranian uh, artists, filmmakers, and so forth who were in exile and who were angry at the Islamic revolution and Islamic government and called for the boycott of the film. Um, but the response of the community was so incredible. People came from uh, Washington DC, from Houston, from San Diego, from all over the place, stayed in hotels for a few nights for this eight days of, uh, of, of intensive film screening. And that festival is still going, the 26 years or whatever it is. I started a similar thing in, in, uh, in Houston when I moved to, 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 uh, to, to Rice uh, to teach there in 1992. That festival is still going uh, every year. So creating something that annually occurs, um, I think, keeps reminding uh, uh, and reiterating the successes of, um, of Iranians. I'm not sure what that might be, but uh, you know, there are so many institutions in this city that you could uh, hook up with to do that. If I may, you ask about why is it UCLA doing that. Most of us would probably be fired uh, from our positions here if we didn't share this with you. Uh, and I apologize for those who are not from UCLA. with me. Uh, UCLA is usually behind US. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, I may, if I may, I'll just share sure. something seriously. Sure. Yeah. Because we don't know how to work with each other. Yes. We constantly we put each other down. Yeah. Yes. We are learning. One yeah. I think so, yeah. We need to learn how to be a team. Yes. I wish we could. I think that's why tapping into the younger generation yeah. is really good. Because the younger generation, which has grown here, grown up in this country, has learned a lot of the democratic ways, uh, in small ways. You know, not democracy in terms of uh, re leading the country, but in small ways of how to share information, how to not compete with each other unnecessarily, how to not badmouth each other behind each other's back and those sort of things. And you, you see that amongst the young people. Like look at IAB, the uh, Iranian American across the border. It's a little organization that students, mostly women, but also uh, b boys, college educated, in, uh, still in college, they're organized, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. And they, that organization is still going. They're supporting. They have a summer camp. They have various uh, 
uh, events, and they're all doing it on their own, collaborating together. In one of the summer camps, they were teaching how to tar off, the competition for the best tar off. <clears throat> they know how to have fun, and they know how to collaborate. So I think bringing the younger people into the, into the game to learn from them, because I think they have good ideas learned in, 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 in liberal democracies. No, no, go ahead. Well, sorry. No, She's the boss. We to, no, we have to go somewhere else. But it, it, okay, two last because you've been, you've been waiting for a long time quickly, and then Dr. Imrani, and then we'll head out. Okay. Um, so you mentioned in your lecture that you find that the, identify, the identification of Iranian Americans as Persian Americans uh, is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, as uh, an American of Iranian descent, uh, I may not look it, but I'm half Iranian. <laughs> My family has identified as Persian American since they got here in the 60s, well before the revolution. Um, so I wanted to know what reference material you had, uh, mm. or is that personal experience, or essentially how you came to the conclusion that most people right. prefer right. Iranian. Yeah, I, I didn't mean that uh, Iranians didn't use the term Persian before. They, they do, and they have all, all along. But, uh, but I've lived in, in the U.S. since 1964. And 30 years of it has been in L.A. Um, and I've been a constant observer of cultural things. Uh, so I'm, I'm going only by my own, by my own experience. Uh, my experience is that the term Persian the way it is being used now with such pride and such abandon is, is a reaction formation to all the negative um, accumulation of this, all the stuff that I showed you know, over the last three decades. It's, it has really, I think, it's just uh, Iranians have finally had it with Iran, I think. Not everyone, but I think a lot of, a, a lot of Iranians have had it, and they want to be free. They want to be something else and part of the part of the the privilege of exile and diaspora is the opportunity to remake yourself while you're at home you don't have that opportunity because you're constantly reminded of who you are where you came from who's your dad who's your mom who's your neighborhood where were you born what religion what uh, so forth and so on when you go abroad somewhere else nobody knows you at first that's very that's terrible i'm alone i'm isolated i'm lonely Nobody knows me, nobody understands me, and so forth. But there's also a privilege. Nobody knows you, that means you can be whoever you want to be. You can reconstruct yourself. So I'm, sh instead of Iranians for a long time, pushed for roots in the ground, roots in Iran. It's now time to push for routes. R push for the ways that you want to select to go, places you want to go, identities you want to have. I'm not talking about you know, performing an identity or faking an identity, but finding an identity that you want to have that it suits to your idea, your personality, your, your background, your education, your you know, f family values, whatever. And I think that's where I stand anyway myself. I think I, I want, uh, I am happy to be here because I can I'm not the son of my father here. If I go to uh, Esfahan, where my dad was a famous uh, uh, doctor, everybody says, oh, yes, we know who you are. And nobody cares what the, what the hell I say, because I'm the son of that guy. I don't have an opportunity to be myself, to show who I am. But here I am able to be free from that root. Um, at the same time that I am also able to benefit from it because I have not forgotten my root. I speak Persian very well. I read poetry. I write in it. I enjoy Persian music. I constantly t Skype with my, par with my family uh, back home, and my kids know uh, Persian, and their favorite food is Persian food. So I'm not suggesting that you forget um, where you came from, but also don't regret that you're separated from your roots. 
take the take the life by the ass and and uh, and go where you want to go, where it leads you. Sorry, it sounded like a like a lecture, but since you're a young person uh, in search of uh, routes or routes, go with it. That's right. How do you see that playing into this dance that you were describing? Very much. I think uh, I, th th I didn't talk about it much because in my book on Iranians in, uh, in Los Angeles, which is, which is about the Iranian culture in the first decade after the revolution, when everything was really hot, you know, the exiles knew that they were going to return in six months. Everybody was talking about it. I mean, not unpacking. We're, we're going back six months from now. And so it was a very tumultuous and heated uh, period. I talk a lot about the, what the Iranians themselves were doing. Um, but I think things have changed in many ways. I mean, the, you, ha you have to not, uh, it's important not to underplay the impact of the second generation, the younger Iranians, the 1.5 and 2.0 Iranians, who are born here or who were uh, babies when they came here. And they are, they are, Older generation, our generation, is defensive about being Iranian and is afraid of being American, afraid of speaking up, afraid of critiquing America for fear of being ch uh, charged as, who the hell are you? Go fix your own country. You, you know, you, you don't have a right to speak. The kids, the 1.5 and 2.0 kids, have a right to speak. This is their place. And they're not apologetic about being Iranian-American. That's why the kids from IAB are really uh, refreshing to talk to them because they are Americans, but at the same time, they are Iranians. And they're willing and able to and do critique American society, and they try to change it through whatever organizations they have. And I think so. That's, I think that's all I have to say. Yeah. May I ask the name of your book, please?